In the second half of July, the resistance of the German divisions increases. They have to overcome one fortification after another, and the pace of the offensive slows down considerably. We make sorties every day, from morning until evening, and support the attacking wedges that are advancing in a northerly direction across the Peepsel River along the railroad going to Belgorod. One morning we are suddenly attacked by a large number of Isle II bombers, which approached our airfield at low altitude and were not detected in time. We take off in all directions to get away from the airfield far away, many planes still taxiing to the runway. Miraculously nothing serious happens. Our anti-aircraft guns open the heaviest fire they are capable of, and this apparently does not encourage the IVANs. We see regular 20 anti aircraft shells bounce off the armor of the Russian attack aircraft. Only a few places are vulnerable to these shells, but armor-piercing 20 shells can take down armored Ivans as well. At this time, we suddenly receive orders to move to Oril, on the other side of the ledge, where the Soviets are on the offensive and threatening to recapture the city. A few hours later, we arrive at an airfield north of Oral. Uh, the situation around it roughly corresponds to the rumors that reached us back in Kharkov. The Soviets are attacking the city from the north, east, and south. Our offensive has been halted along the entire front. We clearly understand why this happened. First, the Allied landing in Sicily, and after that, the putsch against Mussolini. Each time our best divisions had to be withdrawn from the battle and transferred to other places in Europe. How often we say to each other during these weeks, the Soviets have only their allies to thank for still existing as a military force. August is a hot month for us in every sense of the word. There is a fierce struggle in the South for possession of the Chromes. During one of our first attacks in the area against a bridge in this town, one very strange thing happens to me. Just as I'm entering the dive, a Russian tank drives onto the bridge. A 500 kg bomb aimed at the bridge hits it when it's halfway across, causing both the tank and the bridge to shatter into small pieces. The defenses here are unusually strong. A few days later to the north, near Bokov, I get a direct hit in the engine. Shrapnel flies right into my face. At first, I think it's time to parachute, but who knows where the wind will take me. There is very little hope of reaching the ground in one piece, especially with the yaks circling the area. Nevertheless, I manage to make a forced landing with my engine stopped at the very German leading edge. The infantry unit occupying the area takes me to our airfield a couple hours later. I immediately take off for the same area. It's a strange feeling to return to the same spot where you've just been shot down but it takes away the hesitation and gloomy thoughts of the risk you're taking. We're going to hit the anti-aircraft battery positions. I'm up high and I can see them opening heavy fire on our formation. Their positions can be recognized by the flashes of their guns. I immediately attack them and order the planes accompanying me to drop their bombs on the Russian anti-aircraft gunners at the same time as me. I fly home with the pleasant feeling that the enemy also got it. Every night, Russian planes raid our airfield near our all. At first, we live in tents, then in stone buildings on the edge of the airfield. Slits are dug next to the tents. We are supposed to take shelter in them during raids. Nevertheless, some of us continue to sleep even during raids, because after a whole day of continuous sorties, a good night's rest is indispensable if we want to be fit to fly the next day. In any case, the Avan usually bombs us all night long. My friend, Walter Krauss, commander of the 3rd Squadron, was killed during one of these raids. A former reconnaissance pilot, he took a refresher course at my place in Graz and soon became a real asset to our regiment. He had just become a squadron commander and was awarded the Oak Leaves. We mourn the loss of our comrade and friend with feelings of deep grief. His death is a real blow. How many heavy blows of fate will we still have to endure? I am given command of the 3rd Squadron. I know it like the back of my hand, did not I once served as its engineer. Although there are new faces here, I've already met them all during my visits to the squadron. It won't be hard to get the squadron in proper shape, especially since Oberlutten Becker is here. We've nicknamed him Friedolin. 
There's nothing he doesn't know. He's the soul and mother of the ground staff. The medical service is in the hands of Dr. Gaderman. He is besides a friend and comforter to all. Soon the third squadron headquarters becomes a real family in which all orders are given and carried out in a spirit of true cooperation and mutual assist. In the case of air operations, this means that no reorganization is needed. Since last year, I often led the formation myself. As part of the squadron, I am soon making my 1,200th combat sortie. As an escort, we are accompanied by a fighter squadron, to which, by pure coincidence, belongs also the famous skier Genevain. Between sorties, we often chat with him about our home mountains and, of course, about skiing. One day he doesn't return from our joint mission and is marked missing in the report. In all probability, he was hit. Then, according to the accounts of his comrades, radioed, got hit in the engine, flying toward the sun. At that time, the sun was almost exactly in the west. He could not have chosen a more unfortunate course, because after the breakthrough north of us in the Bokov area, the Soviets managed to make a bulge in our front line in the form of a funnel, narrowing from east to west. Consequently, if Genevain flew westward, he ended up over the center of this funnel and landed in Russian-occupied territory. If he flew only a few kilometers to the south, that would be enough to reach our positions, since the funnel is very narrow. Near, near Oral, the streak of failure does not stop. The adjutant of the 9th HQ is Horner, a Knight's Cross recipient and one of our senior officers in our squadron. After his plane is hit by anti-aircraft fire northeast of Eagle, it abruptly loses altitude and crashes on no man's land. Then Erna does not emerge from the cockpit of the plane, lying on the slope of a small ravine. At first I believe he made an emergency landing, although it seems to me that he was badly injured while in the air and when his plane hit the ground the impact was too great. After flying over the area several times at low altitude, I could detect no movement in the cockpit. Our medic reaches the wreckage with the help of infantry soldiers, but it is too late and the crew cannot be saved. He takes a priest with him and soon our two comrades are at eternal rest. NTT. For the next few days in our squadron, almost nobody speaks. The pilots exchange the most necessary words. The bitterness of these days suppresses us all. It is the same in other units. During the morning attack on important artillery positions east of Oral, a group of planes from the 1st Squadron flies with my 2nd Squadron, commanded by Captain Yakil. He has become an excellent pilot and has a favorite trick that he does now and then. Wherever he sees an enemy fighter, he attacks it, even though it is far superior to Yake's dive bomber in speed and power of onboard weapons. Back on the Cuban front he made us laugh many times. He believes that his plane is particularly fast, and at full throttle he leaves other planes far behind. This cheerful joker often shoots down fighters. He reminds me of a deer trotting through the woods in search of a hunter, and when he finds one he rushes to the attack with his head bent and antlers out in front. She is the life and soul of the squadron never once repeating himself or stopping to tell jokes from nine o'clock at night until four in the morning. Of course, he also has Boniface Keys Wetter and other ballads in his repertoire. That morning he attacks with other planes a neighboring battery, and we return to base. We are just above the front line when someone shouts, Fighter planes. I see them. They are far away from us and show no intention to attack. Jacob turns and picks a fight with them. He shoots one down, even Fat Jensk, his flight gunner, at other times reliable and responsible, is probably eyeballing the sides rather than in front of him. Another lay five comes in on their tail. I see Yakov's plane go down steeply from a height of 600 meters, flipping upside down with its wheels and exploding from the impact with the ground. I can only guess that in the lust for battle Egbert forgot how low he was flying and should not have gotten carried away with his acrobatic numbers and there we lost him. Many of us have the same thought. Now that the old people are leaving one by one, I can tell exactly when it will be my turn just by looking at the calendar. Everyone faces the end sooner or later. We all wait, and failure keeps us going. Living in constant danger promotes fatalism and a certain insensitivity. 
No one jumps out of bed anymore when bombs fall on us at night. Deadly tired after flying all day, we hear bombs exploding somewhere very close to us in a half-sleep. In the breakthrough zone to the north of us, things are getting worse. Just now there is a threat to Khrushchev, which is to the northwest of us. In order to spend less time on approach to targets and fly to Zizdre sector, which is even further north, we are relocating to Khrushchev airfield. The fighting is in the forests, where it is very difficult to see anything from the air. It is easier for the Reds to camouflage their positions, and it is very difficult to attack them. I very rarely see tanks below, and so I fly more often in a regular bomber. Since I have assumed command of the squadron, the anti-tank group works even more closely with the other machines and the staff work, both technical and tactical, is quickly adapted to the use of anti-tank planes. We stand at Kritche for a short time. There is talk that we will soon be transferred again to the south, where the situation is critical. After several sorties to the Bryansk area, we do return to Kharkov. This time we are based at an airfield south of the city. And here on the Kharkov front in the last few months, there have been great changes. Our full strength divisions have been withdrawn and the Soviets have gone on the offensive. Just one or two days after our arrival, Soviet shells began to fall on the city. Our airfield did not have a large supply of fuel or bombs, so another transfer to another, safer airfield was not unexpected. The new base was 150 kilometers to the south, near the village of Dmitrievka. Since the distance to the front turned out to be quite long, we used two airfields, one in Bavankovo, from where we fly to the Izium area, and the other in Stalino, for flights to the Mayas front. At each of these airfields there is a small group of mechanics who service our airplanes after flights. Defence lines have been established along the Danitz and the Mayas, which are under heavy Soviet attack, and so often our operations officers are the same old Targ, the same forest, the same ravine. We soon do without reading maps and other nonsense. As Steen once said, we're already big guys. To one of our first sorties to the Iseum area someone calls on the radio. Penilora. That's my call sign. Aren't you the guy who was chopping nuts for us? I don't answer, and he repeats his question over and over again. Suddenly I recognize that voice. It is one of the intelligence officers with whom we often interacted, and with whose division we always reached the best understanding. Of course, this is against the rules of secrecy, but I cannot resist the temptation and answer that I really stabbed nuts for them, and he himself, as far as I remember, was fond of soccer. He immediately admits it, and all the cheering crews who heard our conversation dive towards the fiercely barking anti-aircraft guns. This Luftwaffe intelligence officer, surnamed Epp, was one of the best centre-forwards of the Viennese soccer team. Since he was attached to a unit in the thick of the battle, I would meet him often. Captain Anton, who took command of 9-1 Squadron after Horner's death, was killed at the Myers. His plane exploded on the way out of the dive in the same inexplicable manner as it had done several times before. Once again, one of our old-timers, a Knight's Iron Cross recipient, is killed. Some crews die, others take their place, no one stays long. The merciless rhythm of war. Already feel the onset of fall, when we received the order to participate in sorties to the Dnieper front, even further west. For many days we have been flying missions from an airfield northwest of Krasnoamiskoy. Here the Soviets are tearing into the Donetsk industrial area from the east and northeast. Apparently this is a large-scale operation the enemy is everywhere. In addition, they are making continuous raids on our airfield with Boston bombers. This is a great nuisance because service during the raids has to be stopped, and we are late with our sorties. During these raids, we sit in slots dug behind the airplanes and wait for Ivan to finish paddling. Fortunately, our losses in airplanes and equipment are relatively low. No one tells us that the army units passing by our airfield are almost the very last and Ivan is following on their heels. Very little time passes and we are convinced of this ourselves. We take off from the western airfield and flying over the city, gaining altitude, we are to attack enemy troops 40 kilometers to the northeast. 
being over the other end of the city I see in the distance and at some distance six to eight tanks. They are camouflaged and look like our own vehicles. However, the shape of their hulls seems quite odd to me. My musings are interrupted by Henschel. Let's look at those German tanks on the way back. We are flying towards the target. Much farther to the west I encounter strong enemy units, no sign of German troops. We fly back and see these tanks at close range. They are all T-34s, Russians. Their crews are standing behind the vehicles, studying the map. Apparently they are being briefed. Frightened by our appearance, they scatter and climb into their tanks. But at this point we can't do anything because we must first land and replenish our ammunition. Meanwhile, the Soviets are entering the city. Our airfield is located on the other side of it. Ten minutes later, I take off again and look for these tanks among the houses. When they are attacked, the tanks turn sharply, hide behind the houses and quickly disappear from sight. I destroy four of them. Where did the others go? They could show up at our airfield any minute. We can't evacuate it because some of the ground personnel are in the city and we have to wait for them to come back. Only now I remember that I sent one of our officers to the army depots on the east side of the city. He was unusually lucky. It later turned out that his vehicle had touched down the very second the T-34 rounded the corner of the warehouse building. By giving full throttle and squeezing his knees tightly so they wouldn't shake so much, he was able to drive away unharmed. I'm taking off again. The squadron cannot fly with me, otherwise we will not have enough fuel for the inevitable flight to Pavlovka. I can only hope that by the time I return all our men will have already gathered at the airfield. After a long search, I spot two tanks in the western part of the town and destroy them. Apparently they were moving in our direction to smoke out the hornet's nest of Stukars. It's a good time to get away and having had time to set fire to all the malfunctioning airplanes, we take as we circle over the airfield to form up in battle order, I see tank shells bursting on the outskirts of the airfield. They eventually manage to reach our base, but we are no longer there. The compass points west-northwest. A little while later we fly over the road at low altitude. We are being heavily fired upon by a motorized column moving under the protection of tanks. We split up and start circling over the vehicles. Soviet tanks and trucks, mostly American-made, hence it's the Russians. I admit I'm puzzled how these guys ended up so far to the west, but it can only be the Russians. We gain altitude and I give the order to attack the anti-aircraft installations, which must be neutralized first, so that we can launch attacks from low altitude without interference. After we have pacified most of the anti-aircraft guns, we split the column apart and shoot it up. The day is slowly going towards sunset. The whole road looks like a fiery snake. It is a solid traffic jam of burning vehicles and tanks that fail to turn off the road to the right or left. We have spared no one. The material losses of the Soviets are great again. But what is it? I fly over three or four vehicles ahead of the column. On their radiators are our flags. They are German-made trucks. Light signal flares are flying out of the ditches on either side of the road. This is the signal of our own troops. I haven't had that chilling feeling in my stomach in a long time. I'd love to crash into the ground somewhere right here. Could this column be German? Everything's on fire. But why were we coming under so much truck fire? American automobiles end up here. On top of that, I saw with my own eyes men in brown uniforms running. Sweat streaming down my face, a numbing sense of panic gripped me. It is already completely dark when we land in Pavlovka. None of us utters a word. Was this column German? Uncertainty suffocates us. I have no way of finding out over the phone from the army or the Luftwaffe whose column it was. By midnight, a few soldiers arrive. The operations officer interrupts my extremely restless sleep and says there is important news. Our army colleagues want to thank us for helping them escape. They tell us that their trucks were overrun by an enemy convoy. They only had time to run away a hundred meters to take cover from Russian fire in ditches away from the road. It was at that moment that we appeared on the scene and shot the Ivans. Our guys immediately took advantage of the situation and managed to escape. This relieves me of a heavy burden, and I share the jubilation of our fellow soldiers.
Sometime after this incident we find ourselves in Dnipropetrovsk. The airfield is on the eastern bank of the Dnieper, very far from our barracks in the center of the city. For an ordinary Russian city, the place makes a good impression, the same as Kark. Soviet bombers and attack planes attack the bridges on the Dina Ferry in the center of the city almost every day. The Reds hope that by destroying them, they will cut off the retreat of the German troops and make it impossible to supply ammunition and reserves to our army group. So far, we have not seen that they have had any success in their attacks on the bridge, but the inhabitants are triumphant. As soon as the Soviet planes disappear from sight, they rush to the Dnieper with baskets, because they have managed to notice that after each raid a large number of stunned fish appear on the surface. It seems that they haven't eaten so much fish in the city for a long time. We fly northeast and south as the Soviets move forward toward the Dnieper in hopes of preventing our defense line along the river and consolidating positions. At the same time that we are moving our base from Dnipeprovsk to Bolshaya Kostromka, 120 kilometers further west, I lose Becker. He's transferred to Air Division headquarters. For a long time, I resist his transfer because he belongs to our family circle, but it is useless and after long negotiations, the final decision is made. Bolshaya Kostromka is a typical Russian village, with all the advantages and disadvantages that come from it. For us, Central Europeans, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. The village is highly scattered and consists mainly of mud-brick huts, with only a few houses built of stone. The street network has sprung up by itself, without any plan. They are simply unpaved passages that intersect at the most bizarre angles. In bad weather, our cars sink into the mud up to their axles so that it is impossible to get them out. The airfield is located at the northern end of the village, on the road to Apostolovo, which is almost impassable for vehicles. Therefore, our staff wastes no time, and in order to maintain mobility, they start using horses and oxen harness to wagons. Crews often have to approach their airplanes on horseback. They climb onto the wing of their airplane right from the saddle, because the runway looks little better than the roads. In these weather conditions, it resembles an ocean of mud with tiny islands, and if it weren't for the wide tires of the U-87, we might not have been able to take off at all. Our housing is scattered throughout the village. The squadron headquarters is housed in the school building on its southern edge. We even have an officer's mess hall here. The square in front of the building is often turned into a huge puddle, and when it freezes, which sometimes happens, we play hockey here. Ibispark and Fickle never miss an opportunity to play. Recently, however, they have cooled down a bit, and their legs are all bruised. When the weather turns bad, the hockey gates are moved under the roof, the reduced hockey field giving the goalies more trouble. Furniture doesn't suffer from hockey because it simply isn't there. The Russians are shocked by the many small items our soldiers carry with them. They think all these amateur pictures of our houses, our rooms, our girls are propaganda. We have to spend a lot of time to convince them that all this is genuine, that the Germans are not cannibals at all. A few days after we arrived, the Russians came up and asked if they could put icons and crucifixes back on the walls. Previously, under the Soviet regime, they had to hide it all because of the disapproval of their son, daughter or commissaire. The fact that we do not raise any objections seems to encourage them. We try to explain to them that we too have crucifixes and religious paintings in our houses, but they believe it with great difficulty. They hastily put up icons in the red corners and express again, and again the hope that this authorization will not be revoked. They live in fear of the commissars, who keep the whole village under surveillance and spy on its inhabitants. The post of chief informer is often held by the headmaster. We are currently living in an enchanted kingdom of mud and experiencing the resulting difficulties in supply, even food. When I fly low over the Dnipir, I often see both our and Russian troops throwing hand grenades into the water and catching stunned f We are at war. The front line runs along the Dnieper, but every opportunity to feed the troops must be seized. So one day I decide to try my luck with a small 50k dom. Gosler, our quartermaster, 
is sent at the head of a group of non-uniformed soldiers to the Dnieper. Before they leave, I show them on the map a section of the river where I intend to drop the bomb. After circling a little over the river and waiting until I could identify our guys, I throw the bomb from a height of 15-20 meters. It falls near the bank and after a short delay explodes. Ours below must have been startled by the explosion because they throw themselves to the ground. A few savvy fishermen, who were fishing in the middle of the river from the side of some ancient vessel that almost capsized from the wave caused by the explosion, quickly swim up and start picking up the stunned fish. From above, I can see the white bellies of dead fish floating on the surface. The soldiers enter the fray and try to pull out as many fish as they can. More fishermen appear on the shore and also start throwing fish onto the shoal. A few hours after my return, a truck with a fishing party returns from the Dnieper, bringing with it several centners of fish. Among the catch are several huge specimens weighing 30-40 kilograms, mostly sturgeons and a type of river carp. For the next ten days we organize real orgies and find the fish diet excellent. Sturgeon, smoked or boiled, is the most tasty. Huge carps are also quite edible. A couple of weeks later, a second fishing expedition is organized with equal at EJ. We fly out on combat missions almost every day and in a variety of directions. To the east and southeast Soviet guns, concentrated near Melitopol, continue artillery bombardment of our Nikopol Bridgehead. Among the names on the map, there are many German ones. Hidelberg Gruntel Gustafeld. Here are the houses of German settlers, whose great-grandfathers developed this area several centuries ago. To the north of us, near Zaporosia, the front turns to the east and passes along the Dnieper, still farther away. After it crosses the river, the Kremenchug sector begins. Behind the Russian lines remain Dnipropetrovsk. In their usual fashion, the Soviets apply pressure in various places, and they often succeed in breaking through the front to a shallow depth. The situation is restored by counterattacks, usually carried out by armored divisions. There is a concrete airstrip in the industrial center of Krivoy Rog, which is north of us, right on the front line, but we can't use it. One morning, the Soviet attack reaches Krivoy Rog and our airfield. The main blow comes from the north, from the direction of Piati Hatka. This is where Captain Mendy goes missing. Despite the most desperate searches, we cannot find our good comrade who has been swallowed up by the vast expanses of Russia. The situation here is also restored by a counterattack, and the front shifts a few kilometers to the east. The supply of our troops goes on without hindrance, and we soon switch to the bridges across the Dnieper. Then our target becomes the enemy grouping between Kremenchug and Dnipropetrovsk. One morning, when a new Russian offensive from the north begins, I have to fly out in bad weather. My task is to get a general picture of the enemy troops' position and to assess the chances of a successful attack by larger forces. Before the flight, I am informed that one of the villages in the battle zone is still held by our troops, but they are under constant attack and urgently need help. This unit is to be contacted, and an air gunner is already on the ground. Our trio is heading into the target area under low clouds. I hear the voice of a familiar air gunner in my headphones and hope that it is him, and not some other officer that I have been ordered to make contact with. I should mention here that each air gunner wants our support for his own division. We have to insist on being told the call sign of the unit in question. The demand for us is so great that we would need 20 times as many men and airplanes to meet all the requests. Judging by the voice, Epp the soccer player is talking to me again, but even without his help I have already noticed the concentration of enemy troops three kilometers ahead. I am still flying over our positions when suddenly, tilting the machine, I see flashes from the shots of many anti-aircraft guns. I do not see the bursts of shells because they are hidden by clouds, but suddenly I feel hits in the cabin and in the engine. I feel shrapnel in my face and hands. The engine is ready to stop at any second. It runs for a couple more minutes and then stalls. During this time I discover a meadow to the west of the village. I'm sure the Russians haven't spotted me yet. Fickle quickly sits down next to me. 
We have no idea how much longer our troops will be able to hold their positions. So Henschel and I take the essentials. Weapons, watches and parachutes and climb into Fickle's car. The third plane from our group has already flown home and the pilot reports the passage. Soon we land successfully in Kostromka. These days Captain Fritzscher is also lucky. After being shot down by fighters southeast of Zaporozhye, near Heidelberg, he successfully ejected with a parachute, but hit his tail feathers. After a brief hospital stay, this excellent pilot awarded the Knight's Cross is back in action. But we're not always so lucky. One day, returning from the front line, we are already flying to our airfield and start coming in one by one to land. Russian fighters appear high above us. They have absolutely no intention of attacking us, but the anti-aircraft guns open fire on them, trying to shoot between our planes. Hurling, the 7th Squadron commander and Krumings, our engineering officer, are hit and go down. Moments later, Fritsch is killed as well. Three inseparable friends, awarded Knight's Crosses, have given their lives for their country. We are stunned by this loss. They were first-class pilots and comrades to their subordinates. Sometimes there are periods here at the front when it is as if a curse falls on people and the series of misfortunes seems endless. I was awarded the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and swords and must arrive for the award at the Führer's headquarters in East Prussia. At about the same time, I destroy my hundredth tank. I am delighted with this award, not least because it is a contribution to my squadron's achievements, but at the same time I am upset that the response to my recommendation to award Henschel the Knight's Cross has not yet arrived. It must have gotten stuck somewhere. In any case, I decide to take my flight gunner to the award. Henschel has just finished his thousandth combat flight, and having on his account several Soviet fighters without any exaggeration, is considered our best gunner. Through Vinitsa, Proskurov, Elvov and Krakow we fly to East Prussia, where in the area of Goldap is the headquarters of the Fuhrer? First we land at Lotzen. I report my arrival to Lieutenant Colonel von Belov. He tells me that at the same time with me oak leaves to the Knight's Cross, we'll receive Major Habak. I have brought Henschel with me and ask Belov if my recommendation has arrived. He answers me that not yet, but immediately promises to find out from the Ricks Marshal in what state is the case. There, too, cannot find these papers and assume that the documents have been handed to the Rex Marshal for signature. Von Belov negotiates everything in words with Goering, goes directly to the Fuhrer and reports to him that I brought Henschel with me for the above-mentioned reasons, and that the Commander-in-Chief of the Luftwaffe has already approved the award. As the reply comes, Henschel must appear with the others. This is a great event for my faithful flight gunner, only a few receive the Knight's Cross from the hands of the Fuhrer himself, because the personal investiture of the Commander-in-Chief begins with the oak leaves. And so, Major Hrabach, Henschel and I stand in formation in the presence of the Fuhrer. First, he pins our awards and after the ceremony has tea with us in his office. He talks about past operations in the East and the lessons to be learned from them. He tells us that new units are now being built up which will undoubtedly be needed to repel the Western Allied landings in Europe. A large number of divisions can still be formed in the country and our industry will be able to supply them with sufficient armament. Meanwhile, the German technical genius, he informed us, continues to work on marvellous projects that will enable us to wrest final victory from the hands of Bolshevism. He is convinced that only the Germans are up to the task. He is proud of his soldiers on the Eastern Front. He knows of their gigantic efforts and the difficulties they face. He is good-looking, full of ideas and confidence in the future. Leaving Lotzen, we have to turn to Gorlitz, where we give our brave U87 a two-day rest. Henschel's home in Saxony, not so far from here, and he leaves by train to meet me again in two days before our flight to the front. Then, in bad weather, we fly through Vienna, Krakow, Livov, Vinitsa and Kirovograd. The farther east we get, the more the imminent onset of winter is felt. Low clouds and thick snow interfere with our flight and make me feel much better when, already at dusk, our machine rolls over the frozen flying field in Kostromka and we are home again, together with our comrades. 
The cold weather has already set in here, but we have no reason to complain about it as the frost improves the condition of the roads in the village. The large open spaces are covered with solid ice and without skates they can be difficult to cross. When we don't fly because of bad weather, we resume our game of hockey. Even those who are least inclined to the sport are infected by the enthusiasm of the others. We use any usable equipment, from real hockey sticks to old brooms and shovels. Primitive Russian skates compete with special shoes equipped with proper hockey blades. Many clumsily run around in fur umbrellas. Only sporting excitement is important. Here in the south of Russia, we have occasional warm days that turn everything back into an impenetrable swamp. Perhaps it has something to do with the influence of the Black or Azov Seas. Our airfield cannot withstand such vicissitudes of climate, and therefore we have to move to a concrete runway in Kyrovrad. One of such periods coincides with Christmas and New Year. Accordingly, the crews who find themselves in Kirovograd have to celebrate the holidays in isolation instead of the squadron's general party. Santa Claus prepared gifts for each soldier. But looking at their faces, no one would have guessed that, for them, it was already the fifth military winter. In early 1944, the bad weather recedes and operations become more intense. The Soviets tear west and southwest from the Dnipropetrovsk area and briefly cut the communication between Krivi Rog and Kirovograd. The counter-offensive conducted by our old friends, the 14th and 24th Armoured Divisions, proves to be extremely successful. In addition to capturing a large number of prisoners and equipment, we managed to achieve a lull, at least temporary, in this sector. We fly constantly from Kyrograd and are stationed near the airfield. The headquarters is stationed nearby. On the day they arrive, a most unpleasant surprise awaits them. The regimental adjutant, Major Becker, nicknamed Freidolin, and the engineering officer, Captain Kachner, are not quite familiar with the local stoves. During the night, carbon dioxide builds up in their room, and when Kachner gets out of bed, he finds Freidolin passed out. He staggered out into the fresh air and carried Freidolin out with him, saving the lives of both of them. For a soldier to lose his life to a stupid accident rather than enemy action is especially tragic. Later we saw the funny side of it and their misadventure becomes a common joke. They constantly have to fight off pranks. At this time, during our combat sorties, we witness a most unusual drama. I fly out with other anti-tank planes to an area southeast of Alexandria. After releasing all our ammunition, we go home to Kirovograd to refuel and replenish shells before the next fair. We fly halfway to Kirovograd and fly over a dense grove. Tanks are moving under us. I recognize them immediately. They are T-34s heading north. In a flash, I gain altitude and circle over the prey. Where the hell did they come from? It's the Russians, no doubt about it. We don't have any shells left, so we have to leave them alone. Who knows where they'll get to by the time we can come back with a new supply of shells and attack them? The T-34s pay no attention to us and go on their way, skirting the grove. Farther to the north, someone else is moving on the ground. We fly there at low altitude and recognize the German TID tanks. So the tankers glare at us from their vehicles, thinking about anything but the proximity of the enemy and a possible fight. The two groups of tanks are moving toward each other, separated only by a small strip of bushes. Neither side can see the other, as the Soviets are moving in a hollow, parallel to the railroad embankment. I fire red flares, swing my wings and drop a note in my container informing my fellow tankers, who is moving in their direction and is already three kilometers away, assuming both sides maintain their course, descending sharply over the spot where the T-34s are now moving. I prompt our tankers about the proximity of the enemy. The two parties slowly converge. We circle above us and wait to see what will happen next. Our tanks stop where there is a gap of several meters in the hedge. At any minute both sides may suddenly see each other at point-blank range. I wait with suspense for a few seconds for both sides to experience the shock. The Russians close the turret hatches. Perhaps they have become suspicious as they watch our desperate maneuvers. They follow all in the same direction, moving fast. The distance separating the two parties is already reduced to 10-15 meters. And here it comes. 
The Russians moving along the hollow have reached the gap and see the enemy right in front of them. The first TV takes exactly two seconds to fire at his opponent from a distance of 15 meters. It explodes and burns, shrapnel flying into the air. In the next few seconds, so far I have not seen one of the remaining T-34s fired. Six Russian tanks are engulfed in flames. The impression is that they are completely taken by surprise and even now have not yet realized what is happening. Several T-34s move under cover of the hedge even closer. Others try to get behind the railroad embankment. They find themselves in the line of sight of German tanks which open fire over the hedge. The whole battle lasts no more than a... This is a unique duel in its own way. Without losses on our side, all T-34s are destroyed. Our comrades on the ground are proud of their success. We are delighted no less. We throw them a note with best wishes and a bar of chocolate and fly home. Eto say. After a series of relatively quiet sorties, it usually doesn't take long before we get another shake-up. The three of us take off, Oberlutens, Fickle and Stola accompanying me on a tank hunt. We have no fighter escort, and the moment we fly past one of our armoured units, twelve, fifteen Aracobras appear with very aggressive intentions. They all have their noses painted red and look like they belong to some elite unit. At the very ground a wild commotion begins, and I am glad that I was able to bring my colleagues home safely, even though our airplanes were not without damage. Our experience is often the subject of evening arguments and reminiscences, Fickle and Stoller believing that we were saved only by a miracle. At the same time, the argument is a useful lesson for our rookies, teaching them the proper choice of evasive tactics in aerial combat. One of our squadrons was stationed for some time at Zinka, north of Nova Ukrainka and west of us. My third squadron also receives orders to move there with all flight personnel while the ground personnel move on the road to Pervormysk. At the end of our stay in Kirovograd, notification of my promotion is received, and I am promoted to the rank of Major. In Zlinka, it seems as if a real winter has arrived. Almost every day a prickly east wind blows. The temperature drops to 20-30 degrees below zero. The impact of the cold affects the number of combat-ready aircraft, because maintenance and repair in the open at these temperatures has its own peculiarities. We are particularly unlucky because the shock wedges of the Russian offensive north of Kirovograd have just penetrated the neck of the valley near the village of Marinovka. The Russians are bringing in very strong reserves there in hopes of consolidating their positions, which will serve as a springboard for a new offensive. Every airplane that is even remotely airworthy is used for low-altitude attacks during one of the sorties in the eastern direction. Hauptmann Fickle comes under heavy fire and makes an emergency landing. The terrain is relatively flat, and I am able to land next to him and take them aboard with the gunner. After a short time, we return to our airfield, having become poorer by one more plane. Russian tanks rarely attack at night, but over the next few days, we, and especially our colleagues to the north, get a taste of this dish as well. At midnight, my intelligence officer excitedly wakes me up and reports that several men from the fighter squadron, stationed at Little Whiskey, have just arrived asking to fly out immediately. The Soviets have stormed their airfield, and the very village where the personnel is staying. It is a cloudless, starry night. I decide to talk to the refugees myself. Maili Whiskey is 30 kilometers to the north and several Luftwaffe units are stationed at their airfield. We can only say that when we were sleeping, we suddenly heard a rumble. And when we looked around, Russian tanks with infantry on armor were already coming past. Another soldier described the invasion of the airfield by tanks. It all happened very close, and obviously they were taken by surprise, because they were wearing nothing but their underwear. I weigh up the situation and conclude that there is no point in taking off now. I need relatively good visibility to hit the tank. It's not good enough even with a clear starry sky. We'll have to wait until dawn. It's pointless to drop a few bombs just to get a breeze on the infantry, especially with German units standing there. Their maintenance units almost helpless against Soviet tanks. We're supposed to take off at dawn. Unfortunately, on the way back, we will have to reckon with the fog, which already looks suspicious. 
We approach the airfield at low altitude and see our heavy anti-aircraft guns in. They've already taken out some of the more enterprising monsters. The rest have taken cover and are out of range. All personnel are in position. When we fly over the airfield, they do the usual military dance, as they have no doubt that we will help them get out of their predi- One T-34 drove right into the ground control tower and stands there tilted on its side amidst the wreckage. Some have taken cover in the factory area. The approach is obstructed by high pipes. We have to be extremely careful not to crash into them. Our cannon fire reverberates throughout the village. We're also dropping bombs. Those Ivans who had advanced the furthest are beginning to realize that they had better trumpet a retreat. For the most part, they are tearing toward the eastern exit of the village, where they can take cover in the many ravines. This is also where their trucks of ammunition and shells are parked. They hope to hold us at bay with their light and medium anti-aircraft guns, but we pelt their positions with bombs and open fire on them with guns, putting them out of action. Soon the trucks catch fire and start exploding one after another. The Ivans are being carried through the snow to the east. Our most difficult job for the day is landing at Zinka, as the fog over the airfield in no way wants to lift, and when we come in for a landing, visibility is extremely limited. By nightfall the squadron makes seven sorties, mine and one other airplane flying fifteen times each. Small whiskey cleared of the enemy, Sixteen enemy tanks destroyed from the air. XA. Shortly after this episode, our flying personnel join our ground services at Pervomysk 70. The airfield here has a small concrete strip, but it is not used except for the airplane standing on it. This prevents their sinking into the mud. It is almost impossible to take off, land or taxi on the ground. The whole place is like a quagmire. Adjacent to the flying field is a small farmhouse in which we are lodged for lodging. After the flights, and on those days when the weather is bad, Gadema, after a long-distance cross-country run, we take a hot and cold bath and then roll naked in the snow in front of the house. The feeling one gets after this procedure is simply unforgettable. It is the same as being born again. Some Pans and Panenka, who happen to pass by at that moment, look at us with amazement. I hope that our athletic appearance alone disproves their propaganda about uncultured Germans. It's without weather reconnaissance. The morning sorties in large groups into this sector proved to be a waste of time. The area in which the targets were located could be covered by fog, and then they could not be attacked. Flying at random would be a waste of precious fuel. Not to mention the fact that bad weather conditions could be fatal for large groups and inexperienced crews. Therefore, the order was given that at dawn each time a weather reconnaissance plane should be sent, and its report on weather conditions in the area of the intended target would determine whether we would take off or not. The task is too important for me to send the first man on such a patrol. Fickle or someone else should fly with him if the lieutenant needs a rest. One morning we are heading for the front. I take advantage of the favourable weather, and we take off before the final dawn. I try to memorise the entire front in this sector. In the twilight I can clearly see the flashes of the enemy's guns. Judging from the intensity of the artillery fire, we can guess the enemy's intentions for the day. As soon as artillery positions can be located, they are mapped. It will not be long before they cannot be seen from the air and so it is likely that a few hours later they will be bombed by Stukas. This intelligence information is also of great interest to our colleagues on the ground. If I flew low over the front line that morning, I can give the army accurate information about the enemy's staging areas. In this way, all possible surprises can be countered that it is an impressive picture, and to me up there, the flashes of enemy guns in the semi-darkness, Remind me of a huge railroad station, on the platform of which lighters are lit and extinguished. Threads of fire, on which are strung bright and dark beads, overtake me and form a kind of connecting line with the ground. The enemy defences have spotted us. Bright coloured flares soar upward. These are the signals exchanged by the units on the ground. Gradually, during our regular morning visits, we begin to get closer and closer to the Ivans. This causes them particular annoyance. 
because in these early hours we often take their tanks by surprise. They also want to take advantage of the beginning of the day to achieve surprise and opens fire on me. One can understand Ivan sending Red Falcons to clear the front shortly after dawn. We often fight with the Red Falcons. These maneuvers are not particularly favorable for us when the enemy is numerically outnumbered and without fighter protection. During this phase of the fighting, Fickle looks very exhausted and Gaterman advises me to let him rest for a while or at least release him from these sorties with me. Even though Fickle says half-jokingly when he remarks after landing in a badly damaged airplane that this mission took another five years off my life, I can see for myself that he is not an athlete and that even his stamina has its limits. But I am grateful that he does not refuse to accompany me on these sorties. And at times like this I always feel that combat friendship is truly a very bright feeling. Our morning reconnaissance is concentrated in the area northwest and southwest of Kirovograd, where the Soviets are making more and more attempts to break through with their inexhaustible mass. If the weather is even remotely flyable, we take off with the home squadron half an hour after our first landing to attack those important targets we have just scouted. Now it is winter and thick fog, makes all observations more of a guessing game, and we take off without any certainty that we will be able to land here in an hour. The impenetrable fog descends to the ground unexpectedly and can hang around for hours. When the weather is like this, an automobile would be more useful than an airplane. Once we make a flight with Fickle, we have already finished our reconnaissance and conducted several attacks from low altitude in the vicinity of Kirovograd. It is now quite light and we are flying west, heading home. We still have halfway to go, but on reaching Novo Ukrainka we suddenly find ourselves in thick fog. Fickle stays very close to me so as not to lose sight of me. Flying over the village, I barely manage to notice a few tall stovepipes. The ground is almost invisible. The upper edge of the fog rises to a great height, so we may not be able to fly over it. Somewhere we will have to go back down again. Who knows what area is covered by these weather conditions. Hold a westerly course for as long as fuel lasts and count on luck, and then maybe make a landing in territory occupied by guerrillas. That's no way out either. We would soon reach our positions, and I might be urgently needed. Besides, after our long reconnaissance flight, we have very little fuel left, so the only thing left is to stay close to the ground and try to reach our airfield in poor visibility. Go around is a continuous grey shroud. No horizon line. Fickle's plane disappeared. I haven't seen it since we flew over Nova Ukranka. Maybe it hit a stovepipe. We can fly through this wall of fog, as long as the terrain stays flat. As soon as there is an obstacle ahead, a telegraph pole, trees or a hill, I have to pull the control stick toward me and immediately plunge into this impenetrable pea soup. To probe my way out of this fog in this way would be very risky. The ground is visible from a height of no more than three, four meters, but at such a height some obstacles can appear quite unexpectedly. I fly only by compass and judging by the clock, I should already be twenty minutes fight from my airfield at Pavomeysk. Now either the plane will give way to hills or the fog will become thicker. I have just barely avoided some high poles. I had enough. Henschel, we're landing. Where exactly to land, I have no idea because I can barely see anything, just one grey haze. I release the flaps and take off the throttle. I keep the airplane at low speed and feel the wheels touching the ground. The landing goes smoothly and after a short run, we come to a stop. Henshiel pulls back the lantern and jumps out with a wide grin. We got lucky this time. Visibility on the ground is no more than 40 meters. We are presumably on a small hillock, the fog flowing off of it somewhere downhill. I hear something that sounds like the sound of a car engine running and ask Henshiel to walk back a bit and look. It might be a road. As he walks, I sit motionless in my trusty U87 and am once again glad to be alive. Henschel is coming back. My hunch turns out to be correct. There is a road running behind us. Army drivers told him that Pavomisk is about 30 kilometers away and that this road leads directly to it. We get in the airplane, start the engine and turn out onto the road. 
Visibility is still no more than 30 meters, at best up to 40. We drive down the wide highway as if we were in a car, obeying the usual rules of the road and letting heavy trucks pass. Where there are more cars, I stop to avoid an accident, just in case drivers don't see my airplane and drive right into it. Many of them think they see a ghost airplane. And so I drive for about two hours going up the hill and down the hill. Then we come to an intersection. There's no way I can get through it with my wings, so I pull off the road. Here I leave the airplane. There are about ten kilometers to Povomysk. An army car passing by gives me a lift, and I soon find myself at the parking lot of our planes. Soon Henschel, who remained a sentry near the car, is replaced. Our comrades had already begun to worry about us, as we could not have been in the air for long with so much fuel and no calls from anywhere, and are now jubilant about our return. Still no sign of fickle. We are greatly alarmed. By noon the fog clears, I reach my airplane and take off right off the road. A few minutes later I land at our airfield and our faithful mechanics ogle the airplane like the prodigal son. After lunch, another sortie. When I go in, Gaderman tells me that Fickle just called from Novo Ukrainka. He and the flight gunner were able to get out of the fog safely. He lost me when the fog got thicker and immediately went in for a landing. Now this is where we rejoice for real. Shortly after these events, the center of gravity of our operations shifts further south. German troops are surrounded in the Cherkasy area, and with the help of fresh reserves, an operation to rescue them must be undertaken. The attack to unlock the cauldron will be conducted from the south and southwest. We support the 11th and 13th Panzer Divisions, which have struck north from the area west of Novi Mirgorod and have reached the river beyond which the Soviets have been able to fortify themselves well. There are many excellent targets for us here. Air activity is high on both sides. Iron Gustavs are trying to imitate us by attacking our tank divisions and their supply units. With our slow U-87s, we do our best to disperse and drive away these ill twos, but they are a little faster than us because they have retractable landing gear. They are also much better armoured and much heavier. This is especially noticeable during an attack. They can pick up speed very quickly. But since we are usually busy striking from low altitudes, there is no time to fight them anyway. During this phase I get lucky during one of the fights with the Iron Gustavs. All our planes are involved in bombing Soviet fortified positions in the forest. I'm circling over them because I'm flying an airplane with anti-tank guns and haven't found a single tank to attack yet. The head diagonally to our course and 300 meters below flies a group of eel 2s escorted by Ley and Aerocobras. My wingman is carrying bombs. I tell him that we are attacking the ILS. We've already started our descent. When I approach them at a distance of 100 meters, I see that I can't approach them because the Elias are again flying faster than me. What's more, the fighters are starting to get interested in me. Two of them have already made a combat turn behind me. It's a bit far for target practice, but I've already caught one of those clumsy birds in my sights and fire one shot from each anti-tank. Gustav turns into a bright orange ball and shatters into small fiery particles. The others seem to have realized where the wind is blowing from. They are being carried down even faster and the distance between them is increasing before my eyes. Besides, it's a good time for me to start evasive action because there are already fighters on the tail of my villain plane. My evasive tactics bring me closer to the squadron and the Russians move away. No doubt they thought that our escort fighters were nearby and shooting me down would prove to be no easy task. In the afternoon, Oberlutent Kantz did not return from a combat sortie in the same sector. With 70 victories to his credit, he topped the list of tank fighters. His luck started with Belgorod and Kharkov, and he had gained a lot of experience since then. His loss is a blow to all of us, and another breach in our camaraderie. The general offensive to unblock the units surrounded in the Cherkasy area is going well and our shock troops manage to punch a passage into the cauldron. As soon as contact is established, the frontier is pushed westward. We fly from Pervomysk to Rakovka. The Novomigorod area remains far behind the Russian line. 
a short time after accomplishing their mission over German territory, American bombers land in Novo Mirgorod. Their Russian allies help prepare the planes for another sortie. The operating base of these planes is in the Mediterranean. However, to the south of us the situation is also changing, and our troops are abandoning the Nikopol bridgehead. The Soviets are tearing forward in the Nikolaev area and German divisions northwest of the city are engaged in the heaviest fighting. In March 1944, our southern front is on the defensive, fiercely contesting the efforts of Russian troops to achieve a decisive breakthrough in a southerly direction, so as to eliminate the entire German front in the south. My squadron of Stukas is operating from the airfield at Rakovka, 200 kilometers north of Odessa, supporting our army units. We are in the air from dawn to dusk. We do everything in our power to help our comrades on the ground, destroying tanks, attacking artillery and Katyusha. Our efforts culminate in success, and we manage to prevent a decisive breakthrough of the front. Moreover, the army, as a result of these victorious actions, is able to retreat in full order to new positions further west in a few weeks. One day, during this battle, we go on a reconnaissance to the northwest along the Dniester. Here the river makes a bend. Romanian troops report large columns of red motorized and armored forces in the vicinity of Iampol. These reports seem simply unbelievable, because if they turn out to be true, it would mean that the Soviets broke through in the north at the same time that they launched their offensive in the south and went almost 200 kilometers deeper into Bessarabia. I fly on a reconnaissance mission along with another airplane. Unfortunately, these fears are confirmed. Strong Soviet groups of all kinds of weapons are accumulating in the area of Yampol. Moreover, they are building a large bridge here. One may not wonder why this operation has gone unnoticed all this time. To us, there is nothing strange about it. We have encountered it too often during the campaign in Russia. Our eastern front is heavily stretched. Very often there are only patrols in the gaps between key points. As soon as this chain of outposts is broken through, the enemy launches an attack in the unprotected zone. Far behind the front line he can only meet with a platoon of bicyclists or a convoy. The vast expanse of this country is the most valuable ally of the Russians. With inexhaustible human resources, the enemy can easily penetrate such a poorly defended vacuum. Although the situation in the neighborhood of Yampol is becoming threatening, we do not consider it absolutely hopeless, because this sector, representing the gateway to their country, has been entrusted to the Romanians. Therefore, during the briefing before the reconnaissance flight, I was told that there were Romanian covering divisions on the Dniester, and therefore I had to be cautious as to the outcome of any attack. From the air, it is difficult to distinguish between Romanians and Russians by the color of their uniforms alone. The strategic objective of the Soviet offensive is clear to encircle our forces in the south and simultaneously strike through ISE toward the Ploiesti oil fields. Since the presence of my squadron is required every day in the Nikolaev area, we cannot at first make more than one or two sorties to this sector. We use the forward airfield at Kotovsk, south of Balta, for our operations. So this mission now takes us westward. Our main objective is the concentration of troops in the vicinity of Yampol and the bridge that is being built here. After each attack, the Soviets immediately replace the damaged pontoons and complete the bridge even faster. They try to thwart our attacks with heavy anti-aircraft fire and fighters, but we never once allow them to drive us back until we complete our mission. Our success is backed up by intercepted Russian radio messages. These consist mostly of complaints about their own fighters, red falcons, accusations of cowardice, and enumerations of losses in men, military equipment, and building materials. We can often listen to Russian radio telephone conversations between ground troops and red falcons. There is one officer in my squadron who knows Russian. He tunes the receiver to their wave and does simultaneous translation. The Russians often yell wildly over the radio telephone to interfere with our conversations. They use virtually the same frequency as we do. During flights, the Soviets often try to give us false targets. Of course, the new targets are deep inside German positions. The corrections are made in fluent German. 
but we quickly figure out this trickery and immediately after receiving such false corrections. I descend to make sure that the intended target is really an enemy target. Often we hear the warning shout, stop attacking. Our troops are in the target area. You can bet your ass it's the Russian speaking. His last words are often drowned out by the rumble of bombs. We laugh when we hear ground control cursing the Russian fighters afterward. Red Falcons, we will inform your commissar of your cowardice. Attack that Nazi scum. We have casualties again. We have long been aware of the low morale of the Red Fighters, only a few strike air regiments being exceptions to this rule. These casualty reports are valuable evidence of our success.